Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Michael Farrell, Executive Director of the Coalition for the Homeless. The Coalition helps the homeless and at risk return to self-sufficiency through residential and social services in the metropolitan Washington, D.C. area. Michael has worked with the Coalition since 1989, and previous to that, he served youth at the D.C. Department of Employment Services. He has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Michael, for joining us today. Well, thank you, Mark, for having me. The homeless are so often invisible to us. So often the homeless and problems of homelessness are managed by society to be invisible. Talk about this invisible yet ever-present and visible problem. The homelessness problem in, in, in the country has grown over the years and there have been a number of efforts uh, both recently and in the past to target quite frankly the chronically homeless who are more typically defined as the street homeless. Uh, I've been involved in this work since 1980 and so statistically the, the number of quote-unquote persons who would be classified as the street homeless, those individuals that you see on, on the corners and alleyways, etc. There's been a targeted focus, you know, by the U.S. government, principally HUD, right. to target the chronically homeless who more times than not are persons who are living on the streets and in alleyways and campsites around the country and so forth. Targeting that particularly most vulnerable part of the homeless population to help them to get off of the streets into shelter and ultimately into permanent housing. And so, it, so lately, in the last five years or so, there's really has been a very strategic concert and concerted effort to target that particular group. And so, uh, the fact that you, it may be viewed as invisible, at, at least recently, I would say, is intentional because there's really been uh, more emphasis, st strategically and financially, placed on reducing the number of homeless persons living on our streets. Let's deconstruct the problem. Mm. Could you take us through a, a, a picture of who is, who are the homeless? On your adult side now, and I'll talk about this, the single male population. You, in, in your single male population, you're talking about a, a, an individual who is, is middle-aged, you know, from a national perspective, about 45 years of age. Uh, the individual has a high school education or less than a high school education, uh, has few marketable skills. The two factors that are most distinguishing are th the fact that 60% uh, or so of the individuals have substance abuse problems. So right. they're dealing with issues of, of drug and or alcohol dependency. And another large subpopulation are those who have mental health problems. When we look at single female, we see actually a higher number who have mental health problems in addition to domestic violence and abuse issues. On, on the family side, you know, primarily we're looking at families who are uh, struggling at or below the poverty levels, you know, in, in the United States. And so th those are really, their, their problems are more economically driven than for your male and female population. How do you respond given the, the multitude of different requirements of these uh, different individuals? So our target populations are single men and families. And with respect to the single men, uh, the, the primary focus first and foremost is on their substance abuse issues. Uh, I think it is important to know that we do individualize service plans for each person and family who comes into the program because everyone is not the same. Right. So uh, we don't have a cookie cutter approach. But statistically, we know that the majority of the male population we're servicing have substance abuse issues. And so we have the, the appropriate complement of staff, substance abuse counselors and social workers who are trained in that area to help those individuals become stabilized in their, in their recovery process. And from there, we attempt to help those individuals to find employment and ultimately permanent housing. And, and that process can take you know, as, as little as six months, but it's not unusual for it to take a year, year and a half to move an individual from uh, abu actively abusing substances 
to stabilizing themselves and then going through the employment and job search phase so that they ultimately uh, obtain employment that they can sustain themselves in permanent housing. Uh, on the family side, since we're not looking principally at the substance abuse issue, there's certainly some families, the head of household mm -hmm. has those issues. Yeah, but for families, it really is about helping them to move uh, up the economic ladder. So if they come into the program unemployed, then our strategy is to work with them to find appropriate employment or training. And in some cases, you need to do the training first before you can help an individual uh, gain employment. But employment and training are geared towards helping those individuals to uh, ultimately become more self-sustaining, more self-sufficient, and moving into permanent housing. There is some criticism of the uh, services approach to uh, these issues, that this is fostering a culture of codependence, that you have people who never actually ha are, are able uh, to move out of this cycle. You're absolutely on point. Uh, an individual moves out of, of shelter in and of itself doesn't guarantee you that they're going to stay out of shelter. Right. Uh, so the focus is on helping the individuals to maintain employment and, and maintain their housing you know, for the long term. And so we do follow up you know, with the individuals and families who leave our, our shelter programs. And we also have an open system. And what I mean by open is they always know that they can come back for assistance. This is not to encourage people to come back into homelessness, but certainly that they may need some additional supports. How do you deal with situations where people are constantly cycling through, cycling through, cycling through, and they're not showing uh, evidence of, of change? Or do you bring your team to bear and create new plans and, and, uh, and approach treatment uh, differently and approach your services differently for those subgroups? That's a really a great question because if an individual returns, we really want to focus in on the why. Exactly what were the set of circumstances that led that individual to returning to, to us, to, to homelessness? Case in point, uh, if an individual leaves us employed and, and has been stably employed for you know, a year uh, and stably housed for a year, uh, and, this, and this is a very you know, real example given the current economic situation, so they lose their job due to no fault of their own. Uh, despite their best efforts, you know, they find themselves coming back into shelter. So that's, that's one scenario. Uh, that certainly does play out. But then you have something on the other side of, of the spectrum where we talk about the substance abuse. The individual relapse. Right. You know, they've left shelter, you know, they've been housed, but they find themselves going back to bad habits, their old habits. And, and, and the thing that I think is important is that we lose sight of the fact that in our neighborhoods, those of us who are fortunate enough to live under different circumstances, we lose our jobs too. We might lapse into behaviors that are not so wonderful too. We go through depressions as well. But there is more of a buffer there for us that can help us shift our own behaviors. Um, for, for many people, there is just not that resource, that, that, that buffer. So there is sometimes a criticism and a separation into those people and us, you know, into, into the making somebody who really is having the same kind of experience that we ourselves are having in our own lives and make that into a foreign experience. And it really isn't. It is the same experience. It is, but it plays out differently, differently. for each individual, for each family. Uh, some people, some families have um, stronger Right. Uh, support systems on, on the front end you know, than others. Uh, for those individuals who have very strong support systems, uh, perhaps the descent into homelessness, if you will, takes a little longer. Look at the foreclosure crisis, for example. You know, one of the things that we were critically concerned about at the beginning of that 
was that we might see a major increase in the number of, of persons, families in particular, who would become homeless. And we found that not to be the case because in many cases, those individuals, while they were no longer able to afford mortgages, they became renters again. Right. Okay. And, and so they did not become literally homeless. Uh, they also had family support systems in place. Okay. And so maybe they did not become renters, but you know, they're now living with family or friends. So certainly some of those individuals, unfortunately, did become homeless, but the majority of them did not. Uh, because if they had, our numbers would just be overwhelming. Does the Coalition for the Homeless uh, take on a number of hybrid roles that map to um, the roles that, for example, a, a church or a religious institution might, might uh, play, or a communal organization, or um, a, a group of friends might play? Um, in terms of providing a place where one can talk about one's, one's problems with somebody, is this not only a client relationship, but is this also a community relationship it, that you've it, fostered? It absolutely is a community relationship. And once a person comes into the homeless system, uh, they acquire a new family, if you will, or another family. Mm -hmm. And, and certainly that be also becomes a part of their support system, uh, especially for those individuals who have substance abuse problems because there are others that you're surrounded by who have the same problem right. but have a greater level of stability and maturity in, in their recovery than you do. And you can utilize you know, their strengths you know, to help you with your recovery. And so. That, that certainly is a, a part of the family. In fact, we very much so encourage that family orientation in our programs in order to help individuals. And we have many individuals who come back to the program a, as our alumni to help other individuals who are still in the program, who are still struggling with the very issues that th they themselves are still struggling with. Uh, they're just further along in their recovery process, if you will. In terms of, of workforce development, when you have somebody who, as you have described, has a few or even no marketable skills, how do you change that calculus? That is extremely challenging. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion uh, um, just center, centering around that particular issue. You have a large number of individuals whose reading and math skills you know, are below the eighth grade level. Right. And so, that in and of itself makes them less marketable. It's not that the jobs are not available, they're not qualified for the jobs. And so you have to create training opportunities, remedial education opportunities you know, for adults uh, in order to help them gain uh, uh, a functional level of literacy, you know, both in terms of their reading, writing, and math skills, so that they're more employable. When it's not even possible to navigate the simplest of manuals um, or to read the simplest of signs, um, or it's not possible to make change because you don't know what the, if, if you're paid uh, with a, um, with two 20s, what, uh, what, kind of a, what kind of change you would make for $21.78. Um, those are impediments for so many jobs that one could have. Um, and you don't think about it because because it's so obvious, right? It's so it's so simple. We take so much for granted. You're you're given a form and say read it and sign here, here, and here, and you look at it and you can read it perhaps, but it will take you some time. You sit there and you struggle with it, and then the form gets taken away, and they say, "Do you have a problem? Can you read this?" And you get up and you walk out. Right. So how do you deal with that? It's such a huge and intractable problem. That's, that's part of a number of challenges that uh, on the front end we have to first and foremost recognize that those pro problems exist for each individual. Showing up on time. Showing up to, on time. For having, having an appropriate communication style in which you are showing respect without showing obsequiousness. Um, dress, all the different 
small things. Well, those are the soft skills. Right. Okay. And they certainly may help you to get the job, but you still have to have the fundamental primary skills, the reading, writing, and math right. skills in order to secure the job and maintain the job in the long run. They say, you can put anyone in a suit, <laughs> <laughs> you know, or a nice dress. Right. Okay. Uh, and you can reasonably teach that individual how to present themselves uh, more effectively than they currently uh, may be able to at this time. You can do that. Those are your soft skills. They are important. But as you pointed out, if you can't count the money back, if you can't give change you know, from a retail transaction, then everything is for naught. Are we pointing toward a situation where because of the deficiencies in our education system that we get hard baked into particularly our urban populations a certain cluster of people who this um, issue becomes an inevitability or is there something that we systemically can do to address this not only for people who are currently home homeless but also as a preventative measure uh, for homelessness in the future? Well, you certainly begin at where people live. And in, in that context, you know, certainly a, a number of persons who experience homelessness come from you know, disadvantaged social and economic backgrounds. And, and so, you know, so they, they start out from day one, if you will, disadvantaged. In the District of Columbia, for example, uh, over 85% of our families who are in the homeless system are receiving public assistance, or as it's called today, TANF, uh, Temporary Assistance for Needy right. Families. Those families sometimes are second and third generation public assistance. Okay, and so you know, so their children, you know, and their children's children, you know, started out life with you know disadvantage, and and, and it's difficult to overcome. It's not impossible. But it certainly is difficult, and you have to have the appropriate support systems in place. When you look at the school systems, first and foremost, you have to go to school. Once you're in school, you, you have to be engaged. You have to want to learn. Okay? And so you know, we, we hear time and time again about individuals who have behavioral problems, and, and that might be a, a symptomatic of you know, something else that's going on in their lives. But the bottom line is, is that they, they themselves are not engaged, fully engaged in the educational process. And it's, it's tough to, to learn to read when you come from the home of parents who have real difficulty uh, reading. I'm not even talking about different languages. Uh, people who have not really uh, developed or been afforded the ability to develop the, the basic skills that attach to studying. Um, attached to learning things like grammatic structure um, and so on. And so one of the big issues is that the people who are most equipped um, are learned uh, to learn are often afforded the, the greatest resource and the people who are least equipped to learn are afforded the least resource. And that's certainly is by and large what has played out over the years in that regard. And so certainly the, you know, the school systems you know, do play a part in that. And, but you know, as I stated earlier, it still is also important to note that it does involve the individual. The other thing is we talk about the educational system, looking at the District of Columbia. When I was growing up, when I went through high school, we also had vocational high schools. Yes. You know, that, that taught individual skills in the area of plumbing and electricians and masonry and so forth. And so people moved away from that in terms of the educational system. They moved away from that. And now they're realizing they need to move back into that area uh, in order to create some other viable career opportunities, you know, for individuals. Because Stating the obvious, we're building buildings, and, and anyone who lives in a home needs a plumber or an electrician and so forth. And so those are viable uh, skills, they're viable trades, uh, and, and we need to recognize that everyone is not necessarily well-suited for college for, for whatever reason. 
Uh, but everyone needs gainful employment. And the interesting thing is that, is that you keep pointing back to the community. The solution is actually in the community. It doesn't come from outside of the community. There might be some resources that come from outside of the community, that's fine, but the actual expertise seems to be here. The need seems to be here. If, when you point to vocational training and, and, um, and skills as a plumber or uh, uh, in, in masonry or whatever, it's because there's building that needs to go on in D.C. and the D.C. area. So why not create an environment where the community um, can start using its underutilized resources? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is this a matter of creativity and will as well as funding? Certainly funding is always an issue, but in terms of creativity, I, I don't think you have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we had uh, vocational schools, you know, when I grew up. Uh, and so it's just a matter of recommitting resources, you know, to that, those kinds of uh, educational opportunities. And in the district, they're doing that. Uh, but it more needs to be done, you know, in that particular area. And more needs to be done in order to, to recognize that uh, everyone has different skill sets, different uh, aspirations. And to be able to effectively identify, you know, what those aspirations are and skill sets and providing the individuals the, the appropriate educational opportunities and nurturing environments for that are absolutely essential. And so, uh, you know, maybe that requ does require a little bit more creativity, but some of the things that I've talked about in terms of the vocational education has been done before, has been done successfully. And so it certainly, you know, from my vantage point, vantage point means that we should you know, continue to expand at least on that particular area as well as looking at the remedial education uh, needs for individuals who are already behind the curve. When we see gold and iron and copper in the earth, we dig it out, we smelt it, we form it, and we build with it. When we see natural gas and oil in places that are inaccessible, we develop new technologies so that we can use it. When we see the raw material of our people sitting there by the sidelines, it's a call to us to shift realities and start engaging those people in, in our society. And, yeah. and that's what you're doing. Well, we certainly struggle to do that every day. And it's an ongoing challenge, and, but, but we're here to, to try to meet the needs of those in our community. Michael Farrell, thank you very much for your work with the Coalition of the Homeless, and thank you so much for your insights. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for the opportunity to share. Thank you. Thank you.